Assalamualaikum. everyone. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Alhamdulillah. I know it's been a long program, especially if you were here for the earlier program, so that's why we're going to be doing a shorter session today. But for those who are here and watching, we're going to continue from where we left off last month um, on the chapter of Envy. So if you don't have this text, it's called Purification of the Heart, and this is on the spiritual signs, symptoms, diseases of the heart, and how to cure oneself of those diseases, which we all have. So, and this was uh, translated by Shekham Yusuf. So last month we talked about the definition of envy, what it is, which is really wanting someone else, someone to lose a blessing. Being so envious or jealous of a person's blessings that you actually want them to lose it. And there are, this is definitely something that afflicts people. They can't help but see someone have something that they don't have or that they want. And instead of just wanting to also have it, um, the disease is that you, you want them to actually lose it. And it's really about them as opposed to um, you. you. There's there's a, you know, maybe it comes from a hatred or some other emotion as well. But it's uh, that's why it's considered a disease of the heart. So we left off on page 31 where we were talking about the treatments of envy. And so we'll pick up from there. It's a second chapter again if you have the book with you. So another treatment is to know with certainty that holding envy against another person brings harm to oneself. So when you're envious, you're actually really harming yourself, right? Human nature's most primordial instinct is to avoid harm. It's easier for a person to repel negative feelings when he or she realizes that these feelings hurt the soul. For example, if a disgruntled worker comes anxious and angry because he has passed over a promotion, his anxiety and anger harm his soul, mind, and body, and yield nothing for his future. In complaining at length and becoming obsessed with the object of his envy, the person to whom the promotion was granted, he permits the disease to fester in his heart and cause him grief. These cascading feelings will neither help him ascend in his profession nor alter the past. It is an entirely demoralizing exercise that can magnify the original injury he felt. Envy, in fact, can actually damage one's sanity. Resentment may prevent one from accomplishing significant achievements. A person who shuns envy, even when others around him seem to be passing him by, is motivated to excel, unimpeded by depression and resentment. This is a really important point because if you think about the effects of envy, it's that you're harboring all of this resentment that then debilitates you from actually moving towards whatever goal you want, right? Because you're just festering, wallowing in self-pity, anger, why me, why not me, you know, and, and the person who's filled with these types of negative emotions end up further harming themselves, you know, in addition to whatever loss they, they perceive in the beginning. So it's really like just taking a slow course. Right? That's the best way you can look at it. It's, it's affecting you and harming you the most. Unfortunately, the Muslim world is now filled with envy. For example, when many Muslims look at Americans and Europeans, they hurl criticisms, applying all kinds of rhetoric. Ostensibly, one hears moral outrage. However, the root of much of this rhetoric is envy. They have worldly possessions and we do not, is what often comes across. Similarly, when many less fortunate Muslims glance up toward the Gulf nations that have great stores of oil, they cannot resist passing judgment about how the Gulf Arabs squander Muslim money. This type of dialogue stems from envy. The issue is comparing what one has with what another has. And that only fuels envy and brings about no positive impact. This does not mean that one should not criticize. However, criticism should be done with the purpose of being constructive and not destructive. The communist revolution was largely a manifestation of envy. The writings of Karl Marx indicate that he was filled with resentment. Much of his theory is founded on observing the wealthy and desiring that they lose what they have. This is not to suggest that when the wealthy are unjust to the poor, and to the working class, they should not be censored. But from the point of view of sacred law, both the affluent and the needy have their respective obligations. An obligation of the poor is not to envy the rich and harbor resentment toward them. And the rich are obligated to not belittle the indigent, 
grow arrogant, hoard wealth, or work to keep others in need. This is a really important point, especially today socially, because we're seeing this rise in in this anti-capitalist, uh, you know, sentiment. There's a lot of socialism and communism being put, you know, into uh, schools starting at a very young age now in, in academia and other places where, you know, eat the rich, um, you know, the one percent, and there's all this hostility and, and, and anger that stems from looking at people who are wealthy, and not to say that. You know, there are oligarchs, there are people who absolutely abuse their, their wealth and their power. That, that's true. But we as Muslims have to make sure we don't adopt a worldview that is divorced from the fact that Allah subhanahu wa is the one who distributes, right? If you forget that point, then it's very easy to follow, fall into the, the modern, you know, um, spirit, which is to, to just, you know, hate everybody who has more wealth and deem all of them as being somehow oppressive, right? Because that's a very postmodern worldview. It's to look at the ha those who have and those who have not. And, and this like dystopian worldview is what's being perpetuated a lot. And that's why you're seeing now we have class division. We have a lot of division, right? Across racial lines, across gender, across religious lines, and now even class. It's because those, you know, who incite and like to cause division, and this is, you know, a demonic Impulse. Iblis loves nothing more than to sow discord and promote anger in the hearts of, of the human being. So he knows what he's doing, and he does it on this large scale by just you know casting aspersions on everybody that's different than you. So again, it could be a racial thing, it could be a religious thing, it could be a class thing, gender. But we have to remember as Muslims that is not our worldview. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who distributes, and he certain things are in our control, and certain things are not in our. And that's the bottom line. And at the end of the day, it's all from Allah. So if you're on the side of wealth, by the way, that doesn't mean that you're just 100% entitled and privileged and you're absolved of hardship. That's not true. Um, and that's how a person who understands the, the, the deen or the, I mean, the, the world in, in the, the right frame will see it that everybody's being tested always, whether you're wealthy, whether you're poor, whether you have power or you're oppressed, we are all, at all times, being tested. Every single human being. And that's just a fact, right? And wealth, actually, I would say, is a huge tribulation. I would, I mean, I, I know people who are very wealthy, and it's a burden that I would never wish for myself. Because you really don't know who is your true friend, who, who is close to you for you, or who wants to take something from you, right? The same actually with any um, blessing. It comes with a price. You're not sure, right, who's really sincerely, you know, you're close to you. For uh, Some people just covet uh, pe people's, you know, blessings or power. Because when you have wealth, you have usually status, usually a power. So sometimes it's just a ma matter of wanting to be close to you so that they can absorb and take and take advantage of you. So it's a very difficult life. And that's why you see a lot of people who become wealthy, what happens? They become recluse, right? They become recluse. They completely go off the grid. They have very small circles. They lose a lot of friends. People who win the, won the lottery, there's some really outlandish stories of examples of people who've won the lottery and then, you know, lost a lot of people in their life. Or, you know, you, you go and they, go, they get rich in these big, you know, get rich schemes and then so money is a tribulation but if you don't have it what happens is shaitan of course knows that we're vulnerable so he will come and he'll you know make you think that it would fix all of your problems you know if you just had more money um, but there's a lot of cautionary tales and that's just not true so at the end of the day the muslim always knows that to not be pleased with what allah decrees for you is actually a criticism of your creator and that's, that's what we stay away from. Because if you're not happy with what Allah's decreed for you, who are you criticizing? The one who decreed it for you. Right? And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that his most beloved, the Prophet Sallallahu had every tribulation you can imagine. And he was wealthy, uh, the wealthiest human ever to exist. But in terms of material wealth, he did not have much. Right? So... If you, if, if, if we forget that, you know, as, as we are reminded that 
Jannah is surrounded by poverty and hardship and disease and famine and struggle because the people that are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are actually people who tend not to have very much but remain very grateful for what they have, right? That that, you know, is, then it, it, it shapes your understanding that everything you have is from Allah and you just have to stay in a state of gratitude. But Iblis will, will make us ungrateful and that is the, the core of a lot of the disease of the heart is that there's an ingratitude that you're denying something that is true which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, gives to some and he doesn't give to others everybody's tested but if you remain patient and you remain grateful as he promises he will increase you and it is a measure of it's not a measure of your worth just because you don't have certain things the way you accept and submit is a measure of your worth right to whatever it is you have and that's truly what we should all aspire for so then he goes on to say um just don't have too much more, so I'll try to read the rest of this just so we can open it up if there's any comments or questions. So I'm just going to read um, a little bit more here. <clears throat> the Imam says that one way to uproot e envy is to realize with solemn reflection that envy can never benefit its agent. One should also realize that what people attain in terms of material wealth or prestige is from God. He is all-knowing and all-wise. He knows best how to distribute his blessings, and to whom, while we do not possess such knowledge. The basis of the remedy for envy is taqwa, which is having a sense of awe of God, an active awareness of him as the ultimate power over all creation. This diffuses false notions of misappropriated blessings. A hadith states that if you have envy, do not wrong others. If one does not work to remove another person's blessing, then his or her envy is in check and is not the kind that necessarily devours one's good deeds. Envy that devours righteous deeds is envy that impels someone to wrong others. Imam al-Ghazali makes a distinction between various strains of envy. He states that if one hates envy and is ashamed that he or she harbors it, the person is not essentially an envious person. It is important to be aware of the feelings that reside in one's heart. This self-awareness is essential for the purpose of purification. So now there's verses of the poem. This is this text is actually a, a translation of a poem. So there's a few verses here um, that I'll read. Its etiology includes animosity, vying for the love of others, arrogance, poor self-worth, and vanity. Love of leadership and aver uh, avaricious cupidity for things. These seven causes engender envy. As for a blessing that a disbeliever or corrupt Muslim has that enables one to harm others or show aggression because of it, then the malady of second wives is in such instances permissible. So that's just, those are translations of the verses of the poem, so let's read what the description or the further uh, meaning is. The imam now delves into the etiology of the disease, for without discovering the causes of envy, it would be difficult to excise it. The first cause he mentions mentions is enmity, adela. Harboring feelings of animosity toward another makes one highly susceptible to developing envy. Another cause of envy is vying for another's affection or love, which can become vicious, and its effect can linger in a person for a very long time, which is often the case when siblings compete for parental love. On this topic, one may read Frank J. Soloway's Born to Rebel a book with a complex statistical study about birth order and how children are affected by it, how competition for parental love and attention informs a child's personality. The imam next mentions arrogance, the kabbur, a major cause of envy. An arrogant man who sees someone advancing ahead of him will feel that this person is not worthy of such advancement. The pre-Islamic Arabs ex exhibited this when the Prophet ﷺ preached. The disbelievers among the Quraysh, like Abu Jahl, Umaymah ibn Khalaf, Khalaf and Al-Warid ibn Al-Mughira, displayed their arrogance by rejecting that Muhammad this man among them, their own kin, received revelation from God. The Quran exposes their feelings, informing us that each of them secretly wished to receive a revelation from heaven the way the Prophet did, as mentioned in chapter 74, verse 52. This was flagrant envy aimed at the Prophet. When people regard each other as equal, arrogance does not 
foster. However, when someone is suddenly elevated in rank, the dynamics change. Pharaoh grew arrogant and envious when Prophet Musa came to him with God's message. Part of Pharaoh's problem was seeing that a prophet was chosen from among people whom he had enslaved and whom he regarded as lower than the Egyptians. Imam Maulud mentions as another cause for envy, low self-esteem, ta'azus, the feeling that one's worth is com compromised by the fact that another person has gained more. This also was a pathology found in the days of the Prophet when the disbelievers of Quraysh protested aloud, if only this Qur'an had been set down to a great man of either of the two cities. That's chapter 43, verse 31. In other words, they were so entrenched in their mode of tribalism that they could not accept the fact that Muhammad was a true prophet because he was not one of the elite of the two cities, that is, Mecca and Ba'if. In their view, Muhammad was too ordinary for them, too much like them to have been chosen for such a lofty station. They felt, how can he be a prophet while he is like us, and we are not prophets? Love of leadership is another major cause of envy. People in leadership positions often resent others achieving something significant, fearing a change in the equilibrium of power. The envious leader desires that others are deprived of accomplishment and authority. This is akin to covetousness, which the Imam also mentions in the same line. There is, though, a distinction between covetousness and love of leadership. The latter afflicts those who have position already, while covetousness relates to those who do not have it but desire it avariciously. This type of covetousness, called shuh in Arabic, is a desire to have what is in possession of another person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever is safe from the covetousness of his own soul, he is truly successful. Chapter 59, verse 9. And lastly, according to Imam al-Ghazali, because these diseases are common to human nature, the objective, the, excuse me, the objective should be to transform them into something beneficial, to transform a disability into an advantage, which is what successful people tend to do. The Prophet said, there is no acceptable envy except for, of two people. So there's two times where you can have envy. One of them is a person who's been given wealth and spends it toward good causes. Envying such a person is permissible because, because one's desire is to have wealth in order to do the righteous deed of giving to the needy. One may envy such a person desiring to be able to do the same good as well, but not in the sense of hoping that he loses his wealth. The other person is one who has been given wisdom and teaches it to people. A person may envy the wise because he or she wishes to be imbued with some of that wisdom as well in order to teach others. Hence, if one has envy, one should let it not be a fleeting things like worldly assets that are usually hoarded and displayed for show. One should instead desire what will serve one's hereafter. This is how to convert negative feelings into positive ones. So, alhamdulillah, the last two, uh, I mean, this point that was made, this is um, differentiated, actually, it's not envy, it's, it's called actually ghibta. So ghibta is the Arabic word for permissible envy. So you can envy someone if your intentions are right in that you want to have wealth just like they do because, you know, you, you want to be able to benefit people or you want to teach knowledge and, you, you know, you see that they're teaching knowledge. Um, and you also want to benefit people. So in those cases, that's that's a perfectly acceptable um, degree of envy um, because your intentions are not for a for them to lose their blessing, but also their noble intentions. You know, just to want someone, you know, their car, their home, their marriage, their children, their accessories. You know, that's very petty and superficial. There's no benefit of, of wanting what someone else has because you don't know if it's truly a blessing for you or not. But to see behavior or actions that are virtuous and wanting to have a part in that and realizing that you need means to do that, whether that's wealth or knowledge, that's perfectly fine. So just briefly, before I break for Q&A, Imam Ibn al-Qaim al, -Qaim al in one of his texts, he actually has um, 10 cures for envy. So this is a pretty quick, short list I'll read from here. He says, number one, if you feel like you have envy, and remember, the definition is very clear. You actually are compelled to want to remove the 
blessing from another person. So it's okay. It's one thing to just, you know, feel that maybe, <clears throat> you know, that constriction. You see someone has something, you want it, you've been wanting it for a long time, but you don't want any harm to come to them, right? There's no desire for them to lose it or harm. That's not considered envy. You're just a human being. You know, we see good things, we want nice things. It's okay to appreciate good things. It's when you feel compelled to do something. And Audubala, there are people who will plot and scheme and plan to somehow sabotage a person's blessings. You know, people have lost marriage opportunities, they've lost job opportunities because someone else interfered, right? That is the degree that we're talking about. So if you feel you may have that affliction, then these are the cures that are recommended. Number one, we seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from its evil. That you are fully aware and you make you know tawbah and astaghfir and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you from the evil of envy because you realize it's a terrible disease. Two, that you're conscious of Allah, that you actually try to have that taqwa and implement a, a, a constant awareness uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you at all times. Nothing is, escapes his knowledge. Three, that you're patient with one's, you know, the person that you have envy for, because sometimes it could be, again, a very close relationship, um, whether it's a family member, a coworker, but that you don't retaliate against them, but you try to really, um, you know, prevent yourself from acting upon the envy. That you rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because whoever relies on Allah, he suffices him. And this is also a, an important point, because if you seek something, instead of looking to the person who has it, pining for it, longing for it, letting all that negativity fester, redirect your heart to asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that thing. You know, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the benefit of whatever it is you seek. And that is more of a, you know, I mean, there's more a higher chance you'll get the blessing because you're going to the source as opposed to just wanting it. And this is where if you look in the modern world, a lot of people through social media are afflicted with envy because they just sit around, you know, watching everybody else's life and feeling like they're missing out, right? There's this, it's a real problem for many people. They can't help themselves. They'll just jump from one person's, you know, life to another, and then they just sit in this health loathing and hatred because that's exactly what shaitan wants. He wants you to feel terrible about your life, Everybody else is living a fabulous life. You're home, you're stuck, you, you're not going anywhere, your career's stagnant, you don't have a relationship, you don't have kids, you don't have whatever it is you don't have. And so all he does is focus on all the things that you don't have and he wants you to sit there with um, just this feeling of inadequacy and failure as opposed to being proactive and realizing that maybe what's missing is your reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe you're not using the means that we all have access to, which is God, right? How many of us actually go and ask Allah SWT directly for what we want? You know, some of us in our cultures we, or families, we may have been taught like, no, 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 don't, you know, it's ayib, it's shameful, don't, don't, you know, ask for certain things, but that's not good advice, you know? You have to realize that the only one who gives you your blessings and, you know, everything is Allah. So having a, rapport or a relationship with him where you really see him as the munim, the source of all blessings, is much better than turning your heart from him for certain things and only going to him in crisis mode, which is what a lot of us do, right? When we're in crises or when we're, we have problems, we turn to him, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he wants us to, he wants us to have this connection with him where we turn to him always as the first point of every need that we have, right? This is why our, our scholars remind us, like, the Sahaba, they were known, and even, you know, other generations, for doing istikhara for pretty much everything. Like istikhara, right? It's, just, it's a dua that how many of us have been conditioned to think you only do it for big decisions, right? But they would do it for everything. Because their reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was so strong, they didn't want to make any move without feeling some assurance that they turned to Allah and first and foremost asked Him, if it's khair for me, bring it to me. If it's not, keep it, you know, keep it distant from me. They had that, it was like an automatic default. That was what they did. And then they acted as, you know, their hearts 
uh, felt compelled. But, but the point is, is we've been disconnected from that direct line. We only uh, sometimes go to dua for very specific things, but not for everything. You know, just imagine if you have a need, you know, you have a concern, a fear. If you were always like, I'm going to drop to my knees and just turn to Allah, how much more that would solidify um, your relationship and also increase your, uh, your dependence on Him. Uh, emptying the heart of being preoccupied, number five. Emptying the heart of being preoccupied with or thinking about the object of one's envy. We need to turn away from, you know, I mean, we need to find things to do because it's usually when you're not really engaged in beneficial or good acts that you have too much time that you start thinking about these petty things. But if you keep yourself busy and preoccupied with important matters, you won't have time to sit there and envy people. Orienting oneself towards Allah, being sincere with Him, placing His love, pleasure, and penitence to Him in the place of fleeting thoughts of the soul and its baseless aspirations. That's number six. Number seven, seven having pure repentance to Allah from the sins His enemies have led Him to commit. So this is, you know, just being a, a person of Toba, really uh, being a person of constant Toba and realizing that you, you, we're sinning all the time and just to be in that habit. Giving charity and engaging in acts of goodness to the extent possible because that has an amazing effect in repulsing tribulations, the evil eye, and the wickedness of envy. This is the most difficult cure for the ego and the weightiest upon it. No one is given the providence to undertake it except one whose portion of spiritual strength from Allah is great. And it is extinguishing the fire of envy, iniquity, and harm by extending good to the envious person. So this is our scholars have mentioned this. If you envy someone, you have to force yourself to try to do good for them. Instead of, you know, having these negative feelings and harboring them, try to, you know, just do good. Make the offer them, be kind to them, compliment them, but go against your nafs because your nafs will want to somehow vilify them because that makes it easy to justify the envy and negative emotion toward them. And then the last point he has here, number 10, is this is the compendium of all the of the other cures. They all revolve around it, namely pure divine unity and elevating your thought from the effects manifested in creation, something uh, envy revolves around, to the mighty wise cause of those effects. So, again, just having um, a, a broader, more metaphysical understanding of the world, you know, because when you get down to what we call like the horizontal material level everything is reduced it's very low but when you start thinking of a broader level this world is temporal a lot you know nothing is lasting in this world so even if a person has wealth power status there's no guarantee look at you know what we saw um in, in these victims of, of the earthquake you know subhanallah in turkey they were fine one minute and then boom everything is gone that's the nature of this dunya. So why are we putting so much in this dunya when we know that nothing really is, we don't have security here. This is not a place of security. It really isn't. And that's why, like, I, you know, I, my advice to myself always and all of you is to take every moment very seriously. Because sometimes, you know, people don't realize nothing is guaranteed. You know, when you go out of your home, how do you know you're going to come back? Like, really think about it. There's no guarantee. So if you left your home with negative emotions towards someone in your household, you need to have a jolt of taqwa hit your heart and say, wait a second, why did I ch take a chance, right? Because is that the way I want to leave that relationship? With negativity, anger, animosity in my heart? Fear God and realize, like, that's a... To me, I think that's, like, you know, a, probably a... a um, akin to like hell on earth is to live with regret that you can't undo you know that something happens to you or them or whatever something happens and you can't fix you know that that um, you can't undo that so be very careful with with you know taking it uh, like for granted that you're just everything just routine and it's all gonna you know carry on as it does every day there's gonna be a day it's gonna hit all of us we're no every routine you've ever had is gonna be abruptly interrupted and stopped and life will never continue as it did before then but if you are aware of that then you take every moment very seriously so whether it's just going out to go grocery shopping or when you travel please like take it very seriously if you you know are departing and make sure that you 
you know, you're, there's no loose ends that you've really uh, covered as much as you can, especially for like international travel or far travel. Like, I just think we, we're just too comfortable. We think like, oh, we're just going to get on a plane and then hop right back. How do you know that? Like, I really just, who told you that? <laughs> like, it's a lie. It's a total deception. And that's the nature of this dunya is like, it's a place of delusion. You know, we get deluded by what we think is normal, but what's normal, and that's why where that quote is, right? Nothing is guaranteed except for, what is it, death and taxes. So those are the things that are pretty certain are going to come after you, but everything else is up in the air. So death is certain, and may Allah protect us um, and make us people who are mindful to, to not take uh, our, our days, our breaths, our lives, our loved ones for granted, and to really have taqwa and, and to, you know, be careful with, with the amount that we have. So, alhamdulillah, I know um, this is a bit of a rushed session today. I'm sorry. I didn't want to keep you for too long. It's 9.22, so if there are any questions, we can stick around until 9.30, but if you are tired, I completely understand. We can all go home and rest and get cozy in our pajamas. Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah. Any questions, any comments, anything to share? Ramadan, it's coming. Who's ready? Inshallah, Ramadan. Inshallah, this is. Uh, I know it's it's amazing. I'm I'm just kind of marveling at how fast this year went. As you all know, last Ramadan was a bit difficult for me personally. My mother was ill. I also had my um, my ijaza ceremony here at MCC. So Qadiyah we're reciting today was like <laughs> hit me in the heart. Uh, mashallah, may Allah protect and preserve him. But I can't believe it's been almost a year. Like it just it's shocking how quickly time is running, you know, subhanAllah. So, inshallah, we're all blessed to see this beautiful month come in, but if you're not part of this community, um, move here, <laughs> because MCC Ramadan is just a whole other experience, especially with our amazing Qadir and Allah protect and preserve them, so I'm excited and looking forward to that, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. All right, inshallah, we'll go ahead and end. Jazakum Allah khairan. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا عصر إن الإنسان ما في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شر من لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزة يا ما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا also by the way on Saturday at the end of every month, we have this halaqa on Thursday, and then on Saturday morning, we have a halaqa with a support circle. It's a thicker circle. We read Yasin, we read uh, the Rate, we read, uh, mashallah, Sister Sahar, who's here, uh, just beautiful thicker. It's an opportunity for sisters to come together, to hold each other in safe space. We really want people who are just going through things by themselves. If you are single, divorced, widowed, you have grief that you're carrying with you, maybe you're going through health issues, whatever your circumstance is, whatever age you are, please count comments. You're welcome to come. That's why we created that. And inshallah, in the month of Ramadan, we'll do those weekly. But for outside of Ramadan, they're monthly. So this Saturday will happen, inshallah, here, 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock in the morning in this room. And then in Ramadan, those will be monthly circles where we invite all of you, no strings attached, no registration, nothing, just come. The door is always open for you, inshallah. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other announcements? Sahar also has a, a children's story time that she does. So if, you're, uh, if you have young children or grandchildren, please bring them. The live sessions are amazing. You get to hear her sing and read and bring books to life. So we have some wonderful programs here. Any other announcements that you guys have or no? Yes. Thank you. Yes, Saturday is World Hijab Day, and Sister Sana Subhani from Was uh, Wasila Connections will be here, uh, mashallah, and I think she's speaking. So, you know, there's a lot of great programs. If you're not on the MCC newsletter, please join because you'll get updates every week, um, and then we'll have other uh, programs. For those who are interested, next Friday, March 3rd, I will be at um, SRVIC with Sister Heba Al Haddad, who's a therapist with Khalil Center, her and I are going to do a teen youth talk on postmodernism and a lot of the um, social kind of craziness that's happening around us. 
to help navigate through those topics. You know, LGBTQ, a lot of the topics that I know parents are just overwhelmed with. So we invite you to bring your teens to that. That'll be at SRVIC, inshallah. I think those are it for announcements. All right, JazakAllah khair. Thank you so much, everyone. Oh, that's right, Ramadan workshop. Yes, I'm sorry, next Saturday uh, with Sister Amira and Sister Heba and myself, we're, we're doing a Ramadan workshop also here in the morning from 10 to 1 p.m. And then on Sunday, I don't know if there's tickets available, but at MCA, all the way in San Jose, is the Women's Conference with myself, Dr. Haifa Yunus, Dr. Rania Awad, Sister Amina Darwish, and others. So you're all invited. Hopefully there's tickets for those, but I think mean, that's, that's it. Yes. Yes, please, go ahead. If you don't have the... No, please, keep it. Keep it. Keep it for yourself. It's a gift, inshallah. And get, just make it all for us. Thank you so much. Um, if you want the PDF of that file, like we can also give you the PDF for anybody who wants it. Thank you so much. All right, take care. Jazakum Thank you, everyone. Assalamu alaikum.